welcome. Uh, we are here with none other than our friend Ann Bud. Barb and I are so excited. We love to visit with Ann Bud, and we think you will too. So we're recording this conversation so that you can take part in it as well. Uh, welcome, Ann. Thank you, Cynthia and Barb. It's always a big treat to see you, even though we live so far away. I feel like you know, between all the classes that we do, I do get to stay in touch with you, which is really nice. I just call you my sister, Anne. Okay. You can be my sister, Barb, and my sister, Cynthia. Okay. We're sisters. There we go. Okay. Knit sisters. Knit sisters. Yes. <laughs> love it. Barb and I have some questions that we would, we've been dying to ask you, Anne. And the first one, I think, has to do with where did where did this all start? Like, how did you get into knitting? My favorite thing to say is I learned to knit by accident. I, I did not set out to learn to knit. Back in the late 80s, when I was a preteen, my father had a sabbatical and took the family to live in Switzerland. And all of us kids were put in the local schools. And I was in the elementary school, which it was once a week, I think once a week, one afternoon a week, the girls and boys were separated to learn gender specific skills. So the boys got to learn, you know, shop and mechanics and technical drawing and things like that. And the girls got to learn housekeeping and needle crafts. When we first started, when we first got there, they were doing a knitting rotation. And um, I, of course, didn't know how to knit. And everyone you know, was laughing at me because in fourth grade in that school, we were outside of Zurich, um, the girls all did cable lace knee socks. So they're very proficient at a young age, at least back then. So, you know, they just laughed hysterically that I had no concept how to hold the yarn. The teacher would wind it on my hand. Of course, I had to tension it in my left hand because that was the proper Swiss way to do it. And, um, you know, long story short, it ended up being my very favorite part of that year. And I sat through class and didn't understand much of class, but I had to go to school and it was boring, but I loved the knitting part. And in fact, the first thing I knit, they had me knit to learn to knit was a pair of baby booties, which actually could have fit my father because I had tension problems. They were knitted flat and then seamed. My second project I still have, and we made a hobby horse that was to learn how to knit a sock with a heel and gusset. So there's your sock. We also had to do all these stitch patterns so we could learn duplicate stitch. You can see I didn't learn very well. My tension's off. And what I love about this is my horse is so big that the stuffing actually is falling out of it. This was, oh, four times the size of everyone else's hobby horse. And then the idea was you put it on a yard or a broom handle and ride off into the sunset with it. Uh, but I kept it because I, it just makes me laugh every time I see it. And in fact, I did a variation of that in the book, um, Interweave Presents Knitted Gifts, where we I knitted a large sock out of wool and then felted it down and basically made a reproduction of my very first project. What a wonderful souvenir, Anne. Oh my gosh, that's so unique. Love it. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about, you know, fast forward. Like this became your whole career, correct? Knitting. Well, sort of. You know, it was the 70s then, and, you know, there was the women's lib movement, and no self respecting female was going to do anything that would be appeared as a female dominated. Um, activity. So I got a master's degree in science. And all the while, I kept knitting, you know, at the end of the semester. And I would just always knit. 
and in hiding. In hiding, I did. I knit for my parents because they loved it. And at that point, I didn't know to be afraid of knitting uh, knee socks, you know, color stranded knee socks for my parents to wear um, when they went cross country skiing with their, with what those little short pants you wear that come just below the knee. Anyway, um, it was great because I didn't know to be afraid and I tried everything. And then finally, I did get a job. I got a job in my science field, but I also in between had worked at a yarn shop and really enjoyed that. And long story short, the company I was working for was having financial problems and not meeting payroll. So I decided I wanted to quit. My husband, you know, was saying they're not if it's not what you want to do in the long run and they're not paying you in the short run, why are you staying? You know, that was kind of an intelligence test. So I went in the next day. I gave notice. I called up my very good friend who had been working in the yarn store with me and said, you know what? I quit that job. And she said, well, what are you going to do? And words came out of my mouth with no intention of my own. I think I must have heard someone say them somewhere in my past because I said, I don't know, publishing sounds like fun. And at that point, the editor of Handwoven Magazine for Interweave Press was looking for an assistant. So it took me a long time to convince them that they wanted to hire me, but they did. And then I was on staff at Interweave for about 18 years and went through the um, beginning of Interweave Knits Magazine and then was a book editor. So here I am. <laughs> and yeah. And you were actually the editor of Interweave Knitting Magazine for many years, correct? No, I was the managing editor. Managing. So that meant I just made sure everything got done on time. I also, you know, wrote articles, designed pieces, did a lot. But ultimately, the content of the issue was not my responsibility, although I always worked very closely with whoever was the editor at the time. And it was mm -hmm. a lot of fun. Well, and I think that's sort of when we got to know you, Anne, you know, because you published all these great books. So you must have had a lot of content back then that you could put into your own books. And the earliest memory I have was the crate card that you came out with, where it would help yarn shops figure out how much yarn customers needed to do a project. Yeah. And, um, I still have that. It turns out Interweave was sold and all of the books were bought by Penguin Random House, but Penguin didn't want that pamphlet because they didn't know how to deal with it. They only dealt with books. So in a very, let's see, I think I've got it here. Yeah, in, in a very unusual thing, they gave the rights back to me. So now I publish this myself, and what it gives is the yardages for different gauges and different projects. So you can get that, you know, if shops want to wholesale it from me, they can get it from my, you know, contact me. You do the crochet one still, Anne, as well? I did not redo the crochet one. Um, if I had gotten an inkling, you know, maybe I still will because I still have the information and Penguin is not going to, um, they're, they're not going to sell it. So isn't that interesting? <laughs> That's very interesting, Anne. And, you know, um, as a yarn shop owner, I can't tell you how many times our, our little card was worn right out because we used it so much. And from there, that was that the lead in into this series? No, actually, this was the follow up of my first book was called The Knitter's Handy Book of Patterns. And that's the little one that has all these small projects, hats, mittens, gloves, scarves, vests. I think there's sweater socks. Um, and that's where I started this idea. 
of multiple sizes, multiple gauges. And from that, then I did the Knitter's Handy Book of Sweater Patterns, which is where I took sweaters, worked from the bottom up, six different armholes, drop shoulder, modified drop shoulder, circular yoke, raglan, set in sleeve, and saddle shoulder, all at multiple sizes, multiple gauges, you know, so that was great. But when my, I think it was when that book came out, I hadn't, I can't remember if it was that book or just the first book where I hadn't given specific yarn amounts. So what I did was create this sort of as a companion, you know, okay, you know, because it, well, I just didn't. <laughs> and then I did. So then the final in that series is the Knitter's Handy Book of Top-Down Sweaters. And that, I thought that was going to be an easy, you know, change from bottom up to top down. It takes so much more words and time and space to explain how to do a sweater from the top down that they had to give me we I, I it was running way over and so we compromised they would give me I think 60 more pages but I had to cut out the drop shoulder and the modified drop shoulder versions so there's only the four and it's a much bigger book just because it's that much more complicated to explain how to knit a sweater from the top down because you're starting with all the armhole and neck shaping and that it's just a lot harder. Isn't that interesting? And yet I, I imagine that so many people find it easier because they're all knitting them from the top down. Well, there are, there's some real advantages one is that you can try it on as you go, you know, and so, yeah, you know, that's nice to see if the shoulders and you get all of this mess, complicated stuff worked out at the get go, you know, and then you just knit till it's the length you want and you bind off. The And people love not having to sew seams. And so that book is all seamless. I. I don't, I mean, I'm old fashioned. I learned to knit sweaters and pieces and seam them up. And I really like seamed sweaters. They give really good structure to your sweater. And it's easier to knit just part of the sweater, you know, just the front or the back. And I like knitting from the bottom up because all of the shaping that you have to do is done with decreases. You've already got the stitch pattern centered in the body, and then you're just going to decrease for the neck and the armhole. Well, when you're designing from the top down, you've got to know how many stitches you're going to have way down at the body before you cast on for the back neck and um, center that pattern because um, it, it's it's harder. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and Barb, I see you're wearing a sweater that came out of one of the classes that we ran with Anne. So I think let's talk a little bit about, um, <clears throat> you know, COVID hit. And, uh, you know, Anne, you were doing these wonderful retreats uh, where people could come and they could learn, you know, all kinds of things. They could learn how to knit a skirt. They could learn, uh, you brought, you know, other lovely designers with you and they would teach classes. And then COVID hit and that all of that kind of got shut down, but it gave us a new opportunity. Uh, yeah. Tell us about Yeah, it really did. Classes. I mean, before COVID, I was doing two or three knit for fun retreats a year. One was up in Canada with you folks, that was so much fun, um, where we'd have um, three teachers plus me, and, you know, it was a weekend of classes and a lot of fun. It was great. COVID hit and just everything stopped. I was also at that point traveling at least twice a month to teach. So I was on the road all the time. And part of me thinks, you know, COVID was a really nice thing to happen to me because it just forced, I think a lot of people were like this, it just forced you to stop and take a breath and rethink kind of what's important and, and where do you want to go. 
And initially I thought, well, that's it for teaching. You know, I'm, I'm done. You know, I'm not going to do anything. And then I think it might have been you guys. <laughs> I think it might have been Cynthia said, no, we're, you know, let's try this. And um, uh, she I has such a gentle, such a gentle persuasion. And I know all Cynthia has to say is, what do you think about a boat in, you know, your Canadian about <laughs> uh, anyway? Then I got set up for teaching on Zoom, and I absolutely love it. And as you said, it's opened up these classes that you could never teach in person because they last over eight weeks. The skirt class, um, I think that's four sessions over six weeks. And then all these sweater classes I'm doing, most of them are related to the Knitter's Handy Book of Top Down Sweaters. Um, with different armholes. And those are six sessions over eight or nine weeks. And you just, you know, you, you can't do it otherwise. And everybody's in the comfort of their home. And I do miss the camaraderie that you get when you're in person, but you still get some of it. And the advantage is I just love teaching people how to use my book to create exactly the sweater they want, even if they don't want one of the sizes listed in the book and they don't get one of the gauges in the book because there's ways to work around that and get the sweater you want. And that to me is really pretty thrilling. You know, and from a participant because um, uh, I've taken several of your classes, I have to say I enjoy most the motivation to keep going every week and to finish your garment. And I would imagine that you've been able to see designs completed from your book, which must be a huge accomplishment as well. Feel really good for you. It is very thrilling to see how people have taken you know, I, I don't even call them my designs because they've just taken the foundation in the book and gone with it. And I mean, like, look at the circles on your sweater. I mean, people are doing the most amazing things that I wouldn't have thought of. And I, I love that I'm a little part of that. Mm -hmm. A big part of that. And <laughs> yeah, it, it's um, this sweater that I'm wearing combined uh, two things. One was a pattern that was a cave facet design out of a library of caves pattern designs that I'd always admired, but never had the confidence to try it and to certainly to put it into a sweater yoke. But and with your guidance, I was able to do that. And I love it. It's just, uh, it's a fun piece to wear. It is. It's, it's like leopard skin. <laughs> Not. <laughs> I yes. think it's just fabulous, Barb. <laughs> yeah, so thank you. Mm -hmm. So, you know, tell us a little bit about, um, you know, kind of what you're doing now. And you're doing some fundraising as well. Maybe we can chat a little bit about that. Yeah, um, the my backdrop, the longest day is a... It's an event sponsored by Alzheimer's Association. And the idea is that on the longest day of the year, which is the summer solstice, which is June 22nd, I believe, you do something you love during the daylight hours to bring awareness and hopefully raise funds for Alzheimer's research. You know, the idea that people with dementia are going into the dark, but let's lighten things up. And um, so for a number of years, I've participated in this. Um, I My mother died of complications due to Alzheimer's. And I, a friend's, you know, a friend's husband, and I now have a contemporary of mine, actually, she's a little younger, who's been diagnosed with early Alzheimer's. You know, I, I bet there's nobody who can say they haven't been touched by it in some way. And so this is, I'm having so much fun. I design a special project for the longest day, and then 
for me, the longest day is, is usually the Sunday before the summer solstice because more people can participate on a Sunday than on a Tuesday. And it'll be June 9th, 18th or 19th. I think it's the 18th um, this year. I design a pattern and then I sell the pattern on Ravelry and $5 of every pattern sales goes directly to Alzheimer's research. And during the my longest day, the Sunday, I will knit that pattern again and have Zoom alongs. Um, last year, you guys have been with me. Um, last year, there were six shops. This year, there's going to be eight, I think, or five. Anyway, we, you can go to my page. Cynthia will give you that and get a list. The Zoom meetings are free. We then give little prizes and things to get people to do it, to come along and cheer me on because 16 hours is a long time to knit um, from sunup. Well, I do it from daylight. So it's usually around five o'clock in the morning where I live. And it ends somewhere around 8.30 at night is when the sun goes down and <laughs> I pretty much go down too. During this, we encourage people to make donations for every $50 that someone donates to my team. My team is Team and Bud Knits. For every $50 that's donated, I put their name in a raffle for the thing that I knit that day. Um, okay. This year, it's called the Fading Memories Cowl 2023. And it's a simple um, project that takes the skein that I'm using. It was a 60 gram skein that has a color variation. So far, I try to pick I, I'd like to pick a yarn that fades from dark to light because to me that represents how, you know, the awareness of the people afflicted with um, Alzheimer's fades. And I also try to pick a pattern that might have either lace and a lot of holes, or this one has kind of a zigzag pattern, which to me represents, you know, how things get discombobulated and you kind of forget, you know, well, am I talking about my mother or is that my daughter? You know, and it it gets very confusing, even on the receiving end, you know, trying to talk to someone and not really being able to connect with where their brain's going. Um, so yeah, that's beautiful. So that's your pattern for this year. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. And is, it, is it hard to do? And well, that's the other, it's not hard because it's a little repeat, you know, it's this little lace repeat. And after I think two repeats, then we add a stitch to each repeat. So it's basically the same thing that just keeps getting bigger and wider at the bottom. Um, but it requires that you pay attention. And that's good for those of us who might not yet have Alzheimer's to keep our brain active. In past years, last year, I did a similar cowl that I just called the Fading Memories Cowl. And this one has... Um, the cables to me represent the twists in your memory, and then expanding lace design represents the the holes. A few years back, I did the shawl that um, oh, also yes. expands and has the gradient. Um, and this was called, I think this is the fading memory shawl. And I've done some socks. I've stopped doing socks because there's no way I can get a whole pair of socks done in one day of knitting, even in 16 hours. So I got smart in my later years, and I'm picking patterns that are a little more doable in one day. And I noticed that you're using purple. That's a special yeah. color, right? And that is 
purple and teal are the longest day colors. So I started off, you know, trying to keep the purple. But then, you know, who doesn't love a beautiful black gray gradient? And then this year, there's a little of the purple in there. But what I do is I invite people, buy the pattern, then use whatever yarn you like um, and in whatever color way you like. And um, so you're not, you know, limited to me. The yarn I use is this fiber optics split unified gradient, which is just a 60 gram ball, 65 grams of the yarn, and it's already in the gradient. So once you wind the ball, you can start either at the dark end or the light end and have this total gradient. Or I know in the past, other yarn shops have presented their own gradients that might be out of mini skeins. So there might be four or five mini skeins that then you can build your color change with. That's right. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about it in, in uh, the next podcast coming up. But we're working with uh, Handmaiden in Nova Scotia. And they've created some beautiful purples and Barb and I couldn't decide which color. So we've, we've got a few different colors coming and I think we'll create our own kind of gradient split nice. or, or maybe just, you know, just do it in one color. But mm -hmm. we're very excited about it. And it's a, it's a really fun project, pulls together so many people uh, on one day and uh, yeah and each of the yarn shops then um, has a chance to kind of collaborate as well mm -hmm. and donate to the cause too I think Handmaiden is donating five dollars Canadian to the Canadian Alzheimer's branch I love that yeah and fiber optics is donating four dollars for each skein if you mention that's why you're buying it and you know you get enough people doing this and we're making a big impact, you know, and there's still, you know, I, I think a lot of the suits, uh, you know, the, the CEOs and things are a little bit perplexed, like how do knitters do this? Well, you know, we knitters, we're pretty powerful. You bet. They're a power, a power to contend with, aren't we? That's right. Yeah. So, Anne, you know, what does the future bring for you? That's a big question, I know. But it you is. got plans in the next, you know, year or two? Well, I'll continue doing these um, design workshops through yarn shops like yours. I've also established a brand new class that is going to actually be my first retreat. It's not a knit for fun retreat. This is a design along that's going to be a, it's going to be part Zoom classes, and then it's going to have a three-day retreat in my hometown of Boulder, Colorado. And then it's going to finish up with more Zoom classes. And what we're going to do is design a sweater from the bottom up, in pieces that has to be seamed and has a, a set in sleeve. So you will learn to draft your very own pattern specifically to your measurements. Um, and the set in sleeve is always the hardest one to do because it's, it's closely related to the depth of the armhole and how big your sleeve is at the bicep and all of these things have to fit together. Um, I'm doing it together with Jean DeCoster, who is the founder of Elemental Affects Yarn, and she has a background in clothing design. And the two of us have worked together at different retreats and had been tossing around this idea for, gosh, you know, a couple of years anyway. And um, now it's finally going to happen. The, re the class starts in October and will end. So the first Zoom is at the beginning of October. The third week in October is when we'll meet in Boulder at a historic Hotel Boulderado, which is right on, well, a block from the Pearl Street Mall, which is its own wonderful uh, place. And so you'll have time to go enjoy the mall and then we'll keep 
lessons going by the end of the retreat, you should have your total sweater drafted and have cast on for at least the back, you know, and get started. And then we'll have follow-up Zooms that will last into December just to keep people a pace and to, you know, get you through. We'll have one class just on CME, you know, to make sure you get that right. So it's kind of new and I'm a, a little nervous, but it's going to be really, really fun. Um, as of today, as of yesterday, there's only one spot left in the class. Um, so we'll see. Yeah. Well, we got our seats, right, Cynthia? We got booked in. Yeah, You did. I'm so looking forward to seeing you again in person because that's been a few years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's going to be great. I'm so excited, Anne. I um, have all these thoughts whirling through my head about a sweater design. So to be able to actually get them down on paper, that's yeah. going to be exciting. Yeah. And the great thing that Jean DeCoster brings is her fashion design and her knowing about proportions and what's going to look good on you and how you can make a sweater that that's really going to fit Flatter. you nicely. Yeah. No matter your shape. That's really great. I, so many people have been doing really, really interesting things in sweater fit lately and uh, you know, helping customers and, and people who have problem sizing. Mm -hmm. So I'm so happy Anne, that you're doing this. Uh, tell us a little bit about what's on your needles right now or Maybe ah, it's not well, needles. I just, so let me go back. I just finished three sweater. Was it three sweater design class? I can't remember. I've just finished three sweaters. One was the circular yoke class for you. And I've finished it. And this pattern, I just need to photograph it and send it to the tech editor. And I will make it available on Ravelry. The name of it is Zodi. Z O capital Z O capital D E E. And it I've made it. This is everybody be quiet. This is a Christmas gift for my future daughter-in-law who's named something like that. <laughs> um, so so I got all these things done and then I was in between and hadn't started a new sweater yet. I traveled for the first time last weekend to do an in-person retreat in Alexandria, Virginia. And I took a pair of socks because that's, of course, what you do, what I do when I'm traveling and don't know what to do. And um, I left them on the, in the cab. Oh, no. And I didn't realize it wasn't until I was packing to go home that I couldn't find my knitting. And all I can think is it had to have fallen out of my bag when I was paying the cab driver. It was dark. I didn't see. Um, so somebody has about this much of a sock on Signature double point needles, which are my very <laughs> favorite. Um, so I've already ordered some replacement needles, and um, I certainly have plenty of yarn in my stash that I can mm -hmm. redo that. But you know, oh. you just it's always something, right? So yes. other than that, I have just started swatching. This is um doesn't look like much yet. I'm just swatching for a this will be a set-in sleeve sweater for my brother-in-law. Um, and, of course, he only wears charcoal and black. So I got him to agree to charcoal. <laughs> I won't, I'm too old to knit with flat black yarn, but I agreed I would do this. Um, so that's where I'm headed. Fantastic. Well, and I've got so many more questions on my list, but... Um, I have to check in with Cynthia and see how much more time we have. Cynthia, how are we doing? Yeah, I think we're we're well, we're doing okay. We I think we have time maybe for one more question. 
Okay. Uh, and I, I have to say, I'm, I'm still, you know, I'm still reeling with sadness from, you know, leaving a project behind. And maybe somebody will see this video and you know, contact you because they found these beautiful needles and beautiful yarn. <laughs> Yeah, more likely, you know, whoever's going to find it will say, what the heck is this and throw it out. <laughs> but at least it wasn't a whole sweater. You know, it was only the cuff of a sock. It could have been much, much worse. Oh. I'm more likely to think that whoever uh, sees that and is going to get a memory of their, you know, mom or grandma doing something very similar and they're, they're going to actually drop that off with someone that they know might be able to finish it off for them. Oh, I love that idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Someone would be very, a knitter would be very happy to get those needles. And it wasn't they, just one size. It was two sizes because I always do the top of my sock on a size larger needle so that it's fits the calf muscle a little better. So two complete sets of signature double points. Mm. Whoa. Yeah. Lucky day in Alexandria. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Cynthia, well, what that, question did you have for Anne? Well, that, yeah, that I, as you were talking, Anne, I was just thinking about the classes that you teach for us. So, in addition to the multi session top down sweater classes, and you have a class on sweater design, which is also a multi session class, but a sweater done in pieces. Um, you do these wonderful one hour classes and we have a few coming up, you know, one is on happy heels. Another one is on sweater seaming. Um, and I noticed Dan, when you sat down that you have a project on your chair too, that involves shadow knitting. And that's, that's a really great class. So do you, do you, I, how do you find, you know, putting, these what, what would you call them like sort of like tidbits of information or really focusing in on a specific um technique or, or a level of content do you, do you like doing those kinds of classes as well yeah and I used to do those before COVID that was my mainstay and my classes most of them were designed to fit into three hours so either a morning or an afternoon of an in-person class well on Zoom, I can condense them to one hour. So they become a one hour class. And I just focus on that one topic. Um, for people who might not have seen, this is my um, shadow knit shawl called the Lauren Chevron shawl, where it looks very complicated, but it's simply two rows each of two colors, the alternating, the burgundy and the gray in this wonderful chevron pattern and it's incredibly warm i have it on my chair because it's been very cold in our house this winter um, and i often put it over my lap um it's and um, yeah and and then so the happy heels is where i'm going to demonstrate i think that might be a two-hour class demonstrate three different types of heels for socks because you do have a choice in the heels. They're all based on 50% of the stitches. They're just worked different ways, you know, and so some there's advantages and disadvantages to each of them. So that's a fun one. And then the sweater seaming class. I wish more people would take this and learn to not be afraid of seaming a sweater, because if you seam it correctly and you know, you have to plan from the get-go when you cast on that you're going to seam by adding selvage stitches, you know, so that you'll be able to match up the seams. And you have to count the number of rows in the front and the back to make sure you have exactly the same number of rows. And then the seaming is just simple. You know, it's a little tricky to put the um, sleeve into the armhole, but it's not that hard if you do it the right way. And um, so I would encourage people who are interested in ever seaming their sweaters to take that class because we'll we'll do shoulder seams, we'll do side seams. Well, first we do shoulder seams, then we put a sleeve cap into the armhole, then side seams and sleeve seams. Now in the class, I'm going to demonstrate everything. I give you a handout so that you could knit little swatches and do it yourself, you know, and 
it, typically on my classes, you record them for and make that available for a week. So you don't have to feel in class that you have to remember it all from that one hour. You can go back, especially when you have yarn and needle in your hand. I have to say, too, Anne, your handouts are amazing. Uh, you can tell that you've worked in publishing because you've got uh, really good handouts. They're they're well written and they're they're illustrated, and so that's that's fantastic. And edited, <laughs> yeah. But I still find typos. But yeah, that's yeah. that's just part of being human. And uh, yeah. and again, you know, I think that's one of the wonderful things about your classes, Anne, is that every now and then you show us that it is possible to be human. Uh, <laughs> right indeed and sometimes sometimes you know we have to redo the math or sometimes we might have to you know pick up uh pick up more stitches or less stitches or leave a hole because it's there and come back and fix it later all these things are doable uh because it is um you know knitting is a forgiving art perhaps the fact yeah. that you've got that hobby horse and it's still, you know, it's still doing its job is kind of a <laughs> testament to that. Oh, yeah. Well, thank you. Um, it's fun. You know, I wouldn't change it for anything. So I feel very, very fortunate. Mm. I, I just want to add, you know, I think um, COVID has made so many knitters better knitters. And I think it's given us the time and the opportunity to really invest in our education and in our own learning and, and become better. And I thank you, Anne, for being part of, a, you know, a, a large community that wants to help people become better knitters, because I think we're really doing that one knitter at a time. One knitter at a time. That's right. Um, and, you know, with COVID now, you can take classes from everybody. And on, I mean, it just, it really has exploded how we convey knitting information and others, but, you know, I'm going to speak to the knitting. It's just this whole online um, platform that I'd never heard of is, is really terrific. Yeah. And, you know, as yarn shop owners, Cynthia and I too would often you know, wonder about the yarn that left the store and what had happened to it. And now we're able to see uh, people who purchased yarn and actually made a garment at the end of their classes. So it's so rewarding. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I I think, uh, and we've been, we've been, you know, we've been kind of like friends for a long time, but I remember uh, that I told Barb I had to take a cruise to Australia so I could get on a boat with you and just like, you know, get to know you and see if you might come to our shop and teach classes for us. So it's kind of, uh, it's been, it's been a really fun adventure. I hope you don't mind me stalking you across the world. <laughs> well, you know, it, it that was kind of funny that yeah it was a craft cruise a two-week cruise from sydney australia to auckland new zealand was it auckland no is that where we okay and i only taught the days we were at sea which i think was four days out of the two weeks but it, it was later you kind of came up and said well would you consider coming to edmonton and i was like sure <laughs> you don't have to come to New Zealand to ask me, but that was funny. Yeah, it was fun. I think you had just you had broken your arm uh, shortly before that cruise, and so uh, was still maybe a little bit difficult for you to, um, you know, you had to be careful. Mm -hmm. yeah. Those are, those were it, yeah. It's it's been it's been a great ride, and I'm so glad that we're able to just continue it on. And again, you know, it was wonderful having you here in Edmonton uh, for the retreats. Uh, and but you know, now we get to see you maybe on a more frequent basis, and it's and it's great. So well, that is true. Yeah, yeah, it's working out really well. And I hope your transition from a brick and mortar store selling yarn and supplies to becoming i'm understanding just more information teaching i i i i wish you the best with that and i will help you in any way i can 
Thank you, Anne. We so appreciate that. We've been really listening to our customers too over the last 20 years, and we've compiled a whole bunch of lists of questions that they ask us all the time. <laughs> From, you know, how do I substitute yarn to, um, I've got two balls with two different dye lots, what do I do? <laughs> so we've got lots of content too that we think might be really helpful. Yeah. Well, and then you do it online and then everybody can have access to it. So that, that is wonderful. Exactly, exactly. And I think that's why, you know, those classes like Sweater Seaming, it's one of the things that people often will they'll call us up and they'll say, do you have anybody who finishes sweaters? Because I've got all the pieces. I just don't know how to sew them together. And so we can say, ah, you know, actually, you can do this yourself. We'll, we'll, mm -hmm. we'll connect you with a great instructor who will show you how to do it. Uh, well, listen, and we've taken up, uh, an, I, well, more than an hour of your time, and we've had a delightful conversation. Thank you so much for coming out and hanging with us today. Oh, uh, my pleasure. <laughs> we, we're going to see you again very soon for some classes. And of course, Barbara and I will be uh, cheering you on you know, quite possibly all day on June 18th. Uh, we'll have to see if we can get up that early. Well, Barb, Barb has no problem getting up early in the morning. It's me. I like to sleep in, but we'll we'll be there uh, cheering you on and uh, yeah. looking forward to hosting a one-hour segment of your day and helping you to raise money for this cause, which you're absolutely right, has touched absolutely all of us. Yeah. All right. Well, take care. Okay. Enjoy the rest of your day, and we'll see you soon. Okay. Thanks so much, both of you. Bye. Bye.